hey, we're uh, wrapping up our last batch here at Wrecking Ball in the roastery, and I thought I'd do a little green grading for you, so let's do some green grading of this green coffee sample. I'm just gonna get right into it, because I feel like I have a lot to tell you about, and uh, why don't I just get my hands in there and start and let you know what I'm doing as I do it. First thing I've done is taken this sample of green coffee that was given to me and measured out 350 grams, as you can see, my beautiful Akaya scale. Now I'm ready to go. 350 grams is the standard that the Specialty Coffee Association asks us to measure our sample out at. Hopefully your importer will give you at least that much. Sometimes they'll give you a little bit less. If you really want to grade it, you might have to ask for more. I'm just going to get right into it, like I said. And the first thing I do when I get a sample is I dump it all out. And I make it flat like a pancake. And at this point, I'm going to put on my glasses. I'm going to put on my glasses. And everything that I find with just a quick look on my pancake comes out. It's a one kind of glance over the whole thing. My eyes are scanning it. And I'm just putting it all out there. Anything that looks weird, anything that looks a little bit suspect, even though I, because I have a lot of experience, know what I'm pulling out. You won't maybe know what I'm pulling out, but I'll show it to you. Exactly, and then when I think I've seen everything, I pull it together again. Like I just dumped it and toss it like this. And then I give myself another pancake. And already I'm seeing stuff I should have seen the first pass. Really big deal problems. And I'm pulling them out. When you do this kind of thing with a specialty grade coffee, you aren't gonna get this much stuff. I'm pulling a lot of stuff out because I spiked this sample for us so that we could be, show you all the defects that I possibly could show you. But in real life, your coffee's not gonna be this terrible. It might have some of these things, but not all of these things. I'm just pulling and then I'll pull it together again when I think I've seen everything. This goes so fast, like so, pulling it together and I'm even finding one before I'm done. Another one and I'll find even more stuff I didn't see yet. After I've done about three passes like this, I am going to tell you that I'm pretty sure I have most of the defect in this sample just by doing a quick eye look through. So now I've done three of these pancakes at least, what I call pancakes or patties. I've pulled stuff out. I'm still seeing more stuff because I kind of can't stop myself. But for now, I'm going to just like relax with this and show you where I've gotten with it so far. There's more to be said about this, but we'll put it here for now. And I'll move over here. So I pulled a lot of things out over those three passes of those three different pancakes that I made. I'm not really done with the big pile yet, but I want to stop here because like I said, this is probably most of the category one defects that I'm going to find in this sample because the easier they are to find, they tend to be the worst ones that you'll want to find. And if it were anything like a real examination at your lab or perhaps even a Q course that you're going through, that's the really important part that you don't want to mess up on is category one. So let me go through it one thing at a time and I'll show you these. So here you see this category one defect, the full black. The full black is a pretty intense defect. It's the one that all other defects are sort of measured against as a one-to-one -one ratio. The worst thing that could influence the flavor of the cup. And so what we have is a one-to-one -one ratio. Here's our book, the SCAA Green Grading Handbook. There is a new edition named after the SCA. And I'm still using this old one because I just had it and I like it. There's a lot of stuff to look at in this book, but I'm going to flip past this stuff and go straight to full black on this page. 
On these pages on this book, the Green Grading Handbook, you can see all of the information having to do with this defect. It'll tell you how the defect happened poten potentially. It can tell you not only what it looks like in the visual form, it's also written out there, but it'll also tell you um, what it might do to the cup of coffee. And in this case, it's always bad. The full black always tastes bad. It always tastes like either medicinal, phenolic. It could taste like ferment. It could taste like mold. It's kind of a wild card, but always really, really bad. And so that's why it's a category one. It's if you find one of these in your sample, that is a full defect. If you find two, that's two full defects. So the equivalency when you convert it is one to one. That'll make more sense in a second. But a one to one ratio is the worst thing you can have. And so all other defects are sort of held up to that standard. How many does it take to get a full defect? So on this book, which is I think cool, you can kind of put this sample down right next to the picture. Sometimes the picture in this book is great. Sometimes it's not so great. This sample that I've uh, picked out for you here is even a better picture, better than the picture that sits next to it. Sometimes that happens with this book having to do with color in photography and stuff like that. But I can tell you this particular sample, which I've uh, given you here, is very black, almost bluish black, like a piece of charcoal that goes all the way through the bean like uh, a stone. It's black all throughout and all over the surface and it is not superficial. There are two of these in here. What else do I got here that I pulled out? Here we have something called full sour. This is just as bad as a full black. It's a one-to-one -one ratio and you can see here I have four of them. Ooh, that's pretty terrible. If you go to the book you can read about exactly what happens with a full sour. And I'll just tell you, they don't always look so dramatic like this in this dark brown form. Sometimes they're a little bit amber colored, sometimes a lighter color of orange, but it is through and through just like a stone and not superficial. If you were to scratch the surface with maybe your fingernail or even a piece of sandpaper, you could smell vinegar or sourness. Regardless, the look of it is very sour. And sour kind of comes from the same place that the full black does. It's a rotten piece of seed having to do with overly fermented, past overly fermented into a rotten state. There's a lot of ways that could have happened. And the stories are always unique about how these defects happen. But this is the kind of defect that when roasted will make the cup taste extremely sour and uh, in not a good way, in a very bad way like vinegar. And so this is four, count of four means there are four defects. Already not doing too well, right? What's this one? Ooh, this is not just one thing. What could I got here? Three different things. We have here is foreign matter things that are not coffee. A little stone, a little piece of corn, and a stick, a little wooden stick. These things are just as gives you a sense of how well they prepared the coffee before it was sent to you. Typically, especially coffee doesn't have any of this stuff. So if you even found one of these things, just like these other two, it kicks it out of the specialty category. Zero blacks, zero sours allowed, and zero foreign matter. Why is there a little piece of corn? I don't know. That's a f that one's pretty easy to find. Look at this one. This is what we call a cherry pod. I have some other pictures of a cherry pod. I have this cherry pod sample that I have here. I have in my little bag of goodies, little goodie bag. Cherry pods are when the cherry was not uh, milled after usually in a natural process, sometimes even in a wash process. The milling wasn't good enough to take the, everything off of the seed and so it comes through as a full pod like that. Inside there is a little 
there's a little seed in there, there's a coffee seed in there, and that is a cherry pod. It's not going to taste too terrible, a cherry pod, but the point is, it should be an easy enough thing to not have in your specialty coffee, and so that's why it belongs in the category one defect. What else do we have? Look at this. This one's a pretty good example of what we call severe insect damage. Here's another one. Severe insect damage. What's severe insect damage? The book will tell you. The book tells you everything. What's the difference between severe insect damage and slight insect damage? On this page, and this book is page 15, it'll even tell you. Three or more perforations is a severe insect damage. That means only two would be insect damage. I think I have one of those somewhere too. Here's an example of insect damage with one little hole at the tip of it. Insect damage is when the small boring beetle finds its way into the cherry and has a great time with all the sugars that have developed. Let's see. So those are some examples of category one defects. The difference between this defect, which is a category one insect damage, and this category one the rock is that there's a one-to-one -one equivalent to this rock, and there is a much lighter equivalency, and all the equivalencies are here. The severe insect damage, it takes five severe insect damage to create one full defect. And so I'm just mentioning that to you because that means that the insect damage is far less of a problem than the uh, foreign matter. I'm using this green grading mat that was issued several years ago by the Roasters Guild, the SCAA Roasters Guild, but the information that's here on the site for handy reference hasn't changed and probably won't change. It's all of the defects and their equivalents here that have to do with what's written in the book, again the old book, but those things haven't changed. And so I can see here full black one is the equivalent, but if I go down here to severe insect damage it says five. Again, that means I need five severe insect to equal one category one defect. We like this kind of matte because it's kind of black and matte, matte matte, meaning it's not shiny. And with a severe or pretty intense light spectrum, which is perfect for grading, grading coffee, you're able to let your eyes rest in this area and it doesn't really bother you too much. It also is a slick surface, so lets me slip things around when I need to slip them around easily. So I wouldn't recommend a piece of cloth or fabric that's black just for the sake of it being black. It really needs to be a slick paper or even a piece of um, another material that lets you slip things around easily on, and uh, move things around easily to grade. Okay, so now you sort of have the idea about these primary defects, the ones that are the worst ones to find in your sample, but also the easiest to find. And uh, they're also the ones that have the lowest equivalency. Remember, equivalency it, here listed on my mat, but also in the book that you're using will be clearly labeled. The equivalencies are for you when you write a report out. But there's lots more stuff in here, so let me talk about category two defect. That's a whole different category. I already pulled some out, but when I go to find my category two defect, um, I will need to put my glasses on. And I usually take like 10 beans at a time and pull them out from the big pile and have a, have a look at what I have there very quickly. And this whole process, the first part with the three pancakes, and this sorting part, which I'll do hopefully three times, all of those sorting actions should take about 10 minutes of your time. And then after that, you have 10 minutes to fill out your report. And this is the kind of thing that you look for, whether you're going through a Q exam, a Q grader exam, or if you're just working in your lab and you want to make the efficient use of your time you should try to get everything done within 20 minutes. So I spend 10 minutes sorting like this, 
the pancakes and then I do the category two, which is like this, the harder ones to find. All of that I stop about 10 minutes. I've gotten most of it done. There might be more in there, but it's not enough to change my report because if I'm really good at sorting, I'm able to find what I need in 10 minutes of pulling things out, just like this. So don't make yourself sick over it. Don't obsess over it because the longer time you spend working on your pile, the more you're going to overpick and you'll end up picking things that are not a problem. Here's an example of something that's not a problem. This right here looks different. It's what we call a pea berry. Many of you know what that is. It just is a different kind of seed that never separated into two parts. It grew together. It's usually smaller. And there's no defect attached to this pea berry. If you're pulling all these things out, you're over picking your pile. You might also find something that looks like a wedge, like a section of an orange. That's called a triangle piece. And triangle pieces are also not defects. Sometimes you'll find things that make you wonder if uh, you really need to worry about them. And you'll be looking at them and looking at them and trying to classify them as something. And you come out having looked at your book and everything else and you realize that's just an ugly bean. And sometimes, like with all agricultural products, there's an ugly one that comes out. If you can't classify it in the schedule of, of defects here, it's not a defect and don't try to make something into a defect that isn't a defect. It should fit the description in the book. It should hit all the marks that it has to be to be that defect. Don't try to shoehorn something into defect that isn't defect. So secondary defect. Here's some very important secondary defect. Again, the pea berry is not a secondary defect. You can look through all this stuff yourself, but probably most likely to find things like this. <laughs> This is a broken chipped cut. Here's another example of broken chipped cut. Literally smashed. Something looks like it smashed this little bean. And here's another one. Here's another one here. These are two different versions of broken chipped cut. You can see that the ones without any coloration on them or odd coloration these are smashed probably in the, who knows how, maybe, if I were to speculate, in the hulling process when they take the parchment off, it might have gotten smushed or crushed in some way. This one here has discoloration at the cutting side, and that's probably was broken or chipped or cut in the wet mill. So this was wet when it was damaged, and this was not wet. And so you can see that some kind of other infection came in on the wet one. They're all classified as the same kind of broken chip cut. Probably very likely to find this in specialty coffee. And it's still specialty coffee, you find a little bit of this. There's always going to be a few chips broken cut. It's not the end of the world and doesn't really affect the cup that much unless you have too much broken chipped pieces, in which case that's what roasters hate to find. Because down roasters are trying to roast all different size pieces of the coffee. Not only is it a cosmetic issue, but you'll have different roasts on your hands if you have this problem. You'll have really, really dark roasted chips, and you'll have lighter roasted and unroasted pieces that are larger. Here's one that's highly misclassified, and misclassification is a really important issue for green graders. Misclassification is when you decide something is a defect when it is not a defect. And there you have completely misused your position as a green grader. You've actually called something out that isn't a problem. This is the look of a withered bean. Withered bean, in the book when you read it, there is a description of a wrinkle, looks like a raisin, looks like a piece of dried fruit. They're not easy to find and they're often uh, uh, overlooked, to f but other people will classify other things that look rough and call them withered just because it looks a little bit rough on the surface of the bean. If I can find one that isn't withered, I'd put it next to it. Here's one that looks slightly, might be hard to see in the camera, but if you look at it, it looks a little bit rough on the outside. This bigger one here is not withered, 
this one that I put down first is withered. If you can see the difference, you'll see that the withered does look like a wrinkled piece of a raisin or a prune, literally like it dried out a little bit too soon and that's what happened. This coffee, when it was growing, had less nutrition or less water at a critical juncture in its development and so it's kind of wrinkled up. That's why it's a category two defect. It's not really gonna affect the flavor that much and the equivalent for a withered is five to one. You need five withereds, that again is not a withered, you need five of these to equal one defect. And it just means it's uh, going to be a little bit of a problem for roasters. You might find those if you looked really carefully, but you might also find a lot of these. This is also something you find a lot in specialty coffee. It's hard to, to determine what that particular thing is, but that's because it is two parts of a larger uh, defect that is together as one problem and we call this a shell and shell is very much related to withered because it is when a coffee hasn't had a lot of nutrition a lot of times and you'll get things like this the, the, if you were to pull these two pieces of this larger bean apart you would get something that looks like an elephant ear sometimes people call it that and the inside piece to me sometimes looks like a human ear. This is those two pieces on the side have been unpulled apart here, still intact. That counts as one count. These two count as one, two counts. You need five of these, whether that's all together in one or two separate pieces, shells to equal one full defect. If you see a lot of these, then we have a, maybe a nutritional issue but um, it's not for the grader to decide. The grader just defines them and counts them. This is the shell defect. Specialty coffee gets a lot of brokens, shells. And then the other thing that you'll find, very much something you'd find in a, ca in a specialty coffee, is this. This one's really hard to identify for most beginners. It is immature immature coffee. Part of the reason immature is hard to find is because they look a lot like the full lot of coffee. Sometimes they're the same color as everything else, but you can see they're very um, sharp looking. The silver skin is, is tightly attached to it. They look a little dried out and they look a little runtish, like they didn't really develop and that's exactly what happened. This is an underdeveloped coffee, an immature coffee. Get your eye used to finding immatures. They're really hard to find and you can miss them entirely and not have a good sense of what you have on your hands if you do not know how to pick immatures. If you're not sure if it's an immature, use that little spot next to the picture in the book and read the description of it carefully. How do you know if your coffee is specialty or if this green grading exercise has kicked it out of the specialty realm? There are only allowed five defects five full defects in specialty coffee and they must only be secondary defects or category two. So again, broken chipped cut, shells maybe, immatures, there's a whole bunch of them that fit into this category and those have a lesser impact on the cup. So secondary defects are generally acceptable to an extent in specialty coffee. But if you have any of these category one defects, uh, a foreign matter, a cherry pod, a full black, a full sour. These things are terrible and if you see any evidence of them in your sample they are no longer what we would call a specialty coffee. Specialty coffee standards are pretty strict. So you might be saying to yourself, well I've had lots of coffee that has some defect in it, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. nothing's perfect, right? Yeah, that's true, nothing's perfect. The thing is, coffee used to be much worse than it is today. Uh, because of these standards for specialty coffee, both in the way we taste it and describe it, but also in the green grading standards for defect. Um, because we've had such strict standards, everyone is working hard to try to meet those standards. And in doing so, now we have 
a very strong specialty standard that kind of has survived the test of time. And so I guarantee you, if you had a coffee that had all of these problems in it, it might not pop up in the first cup or the second cup or even the 10th cup, but pretty soon you're gonna taste the problem in this coffee. You'll have one foul cup. It could be a stinker, as they used to say back in the day, which is all manner of problem with your coffee. Then you're gonna regret buying that coffee even a little bit. You might try to retire it to a blend or sell it to someone else or get rid of it in some way. So doing this kind of grading is important for your personal uh, style as a coffee roaster, I guess you could say. How hard do you wanna be holding to this standard? But know that coffee used to be much worse. So this is just the beginning of what you can learn uh, about green grading and how it's important to not only your daily life, but sort of like the overall client, the overall fabric of specialty coffee as we know it today. Um, you can be part of that by being strict about how you decide coffee comes into your roastery and take advantage of the tools that are here. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask through the usual magical channels of social media. Get in contact with me, and I'm here for you.